you know, later. So that might be what I might do uh, for next week, possibly. So, so anyway, in today's lecture, like I said, I'm going to uh, wrap up talking about uh, World War II, uh, and um, I'm going to discuss the end of the war, uh, which we're going to get to uh, today up to 1945. I'm going to try to cram it all in, like as much as I can uh, today uh, overall. And I think we were up to the point where we were talking about how um, you know the Americans and all that, and, and the Allies in the West were starting to take over North Africa back. And also Italy uh, from the Axis powers uh, overall. And uh, so we were just getting to like talking about D Day, the D Day invasion uh, that comes in, uh, comes in next. Uh, and um, here's an overview, of course, of the D Day invasion uh, and, um, of course, what it was. And uh, yeah, what was the D Day invasion? Well, it has different nicknames. Uh, first of all, what it was about was the fact that the Allies were trying to basically take back occupied France, which had been occupied by Nazi Germany since 1944, almost four years that they you know, controlled it uh, more or less. And so uh, they had occupied most of the majority of Europe at that time. And so the D-Day invasion was often called Operation Overlord, is what they nicknamed it. That's the actual code name or the actual invasion that was planned uh, in 1944. And you can see it involved mostly the United States and Britain put up most of the forces. I think we put up like two thirds of the United States of the forces that went into France. Uh, but Britain, yeah, it was in there. Canada put up some forces, free French, uh, even some of the Polish, free Polish forces were kind of involved uh, in the war. Uh, and uh, hey, uh, and um Anyway, um, the uh, they call it the AEF, the actual force that they amassed, which was in Britain uh, to attack uh, Normandy, France, <clears throat> was actually com commanded by the General Dwight D. Eisenhower. They called him Ike, and uh, he led the Allied, uh, Allied Expeditionary Force, or AEF, uh, which would attack into Normandy, France. Uh, on June 6, 1944. In June 6, 1944, it's known as D-Day. That's the actual day that they started the actual invasion uh, of the country, occupied France. <clears throat> now, um, the Allies came up with this plan. I don't know if you know much about it, but it was called Operation Bodyguard. Uh, Operation Bodyguard was this secret um, Allied plan, uh, deception plan, really, to fool Hitler and the Germans on where the attack was going to come. Because uh, there was all kinds of places they could attack, I guess, into France uh, from Britain. And uh, part of it was uh, they created these uh, bogus armies, <clears throat> uh, I think, on the Allied side, if you know about this, where uh, I know the American side had one called, they called it FUSAG, which <clears throat> was an uh, acronym for the First U.S. Army Group which was led by George Patton, and it was a bogus army. It was a fake army. That wasn't real. Uh, and they put it at the Pass de Calais, uh, which is the closest spot between the narrowest passage between Britain and France, uh, where you could attack. The Germans thought they were going to attack there, uh, but they didn't. They attacked at Normandy uh, instead. And um, if you ever heard about the whole bogus armies they created, they created like um, armies where they had like fake tanks, like uh, rubber inflated tanks and rubber inflated like aircraft and things like that uh, to really fool the uh, Axis side, the, the German side, of course, in the war. I've got some other slides we're going to look at later, but that's the amount of, about the amount of troops that participated in the initial D-Day invasion. About 150, 160,000 is about right. It was about what it was. There's more information if you want to look at it. Uh, right here. Um, yeah, here's the actual map showing you how they attacked into Normandy, which is right here in this area. So that's where they came across using mostly amphibious type um, craft, of course, to land their forces there on D-Day. Here's a picture, of course, of the landing on the first day of D-Day, of course, June 6, uh, 1944. Uh, and um, well, it looks like it died on me, but um, 
Now, here it is. There's the landing, actually. Here's the map, of course, showing you uh, where here, where they came, came across the English Channel. And um, they use amphibious forces and also airborne forces uh, to attack into Normandy, France there. And, um, yeah, the D-Day invasion, um, if you study about it, there were various landing beaches they came ashore at, uh, the Allies, on June 6th. Uh, the Americans landed at two main beaches, Omaha and Utah Beach. Uh, Omaha was really the bloodiest of the beaches. Well, they took like three to 4,000 casualties, I think, on the first day. Uh, the British and Canadians landed at three other beaches that were nearby, uh, Gold, Sword, and Juneau. Uh, and then also the British and the Americans had uh, airborne forces they used, along with gliders they brought in to, to bring in you know paratroopers uh, that could attack and seize important crossroads or bridges uh, that were vital to, I guess, forming a beachhead and all that. Uh, one thing about D-Day, it was the largest amphibious invasion in world history, like the largest ever. Uh, 11,000 aircraft, over 5,000 ships, of course, involved. And I don't know if you've heard of Andrew Higgins uh, from New Orleans. Uh, he was this guy that, that constructed boats. That's very famous. Uh, in fact, Hitler called him the new Noah, Andrew Higgins. And Higgins was the one that built all those landing craft, like you're looking at with those men getting out. Uh, they called them Higgins boats or LCVP landing crafts. Uh, and uh, they, they use those a lot in not just uh, in the European theater and all that, but they use them out in the Pacific uh, as well to, uh, you know, to have these uh, amphibious landings, uh, invasions, which were very vital. I think without that, they wouldn't have succeeded, you know, bringing in, bringing in troops to, to seize the landing beaches and all that. Uh, after the landing, what happened was the, uh, the after the Allies landed on Normandy, it led to the Battle of Normandy uh, in northern France, which went on for like two and a half months uh, from June to about August of 1944. That, of course, was a very pivotal battle uh, that eventually led to the fall of Paris. Paris would fall on August 24th, 1944. And so Paris was the second, another capital that fell of course, that was taken back by the Allies. And at that point, the Germans later will retreat. They'll keep retreating because, of, you know, they got to fight two-front war now against the Americans, the British in the West, and then the Soviets in the East. Uh, and so the Germans eventually get sandwiched between two different fronts uh, that are coming in. Uh, with, you've got the Germans being pushed back into Belgium, uh, and then you got the Soviets invading into the Eastern Front uh, as well. So... That's part of why the, the Germans lost the war. The fact that they had to fight a, you know, fight a two-front war uh, and all that. So yeah, here's some land, the landing afterwards. And I think they would end up bring, bringing in like a several million, two or three million men would eventually come in afterwards and eventually invade into, nor uh, into northern France and all that. I need to also talk about uh, Operation Valkyrie what that was about. That's something that's also very famous uh, that happened at the end of World War II. Uh, as the Germans start retreating uh, on the Eastern Front, uh, there was a plot against Hitler. It was called the 20, it's actually called the 20 July plot is what they actually call it. Uh, but there's also another name they call it now, uh, which is Operation Valkyrie, which you may have seen the movie. Like there's been a couple of movies made about it uh, with the most recent one, uh, done by uh, Tom Cruise, I think who played actually the main character that's involved in it, the conspirator. And what it was, the uh, July 20 plot was this uh, conspiracy by the German army uh, to try and overthrow Hitler uh, and kind of take control of the war. Uh, the problem was the Nazis and like the SS had so much power over the whole war uh, that they wanted to try and, you know, seize it back and then maybe they could either win the war or even maybe even sue for peace with the allies early and end the war. Cause I think at that point, a lot of the Germans were thinking the war was just about over and all that. And uh, the main conspirator was Klaus von Stauffenberg, who was a German officer. I think he was a colonel in the German Wehrmacht, the German army. 
And uh, Stauffenberg on July 20th uh, went to uh, Hitler's headquarters in East Prussia uh, called the Wolf's Lair, which was a, his military headquarters near what is called Rastenburg. It used to be in part of uh, East Germany, but it's not there anymore. And um, anyway, what happened was he had a bomb in a suitcase and uh, he set the bomb to go off and left the meeting and the bomb blew up, but it didn't kill Hitler. It, fa it failed actually to kill him. Uh, basically. And Stauffenberg tried to fly back to Berlin and, and, and start some kind of coup uh, against Hitler. Uh, but the plot failed and all the conspirators were eventually arrested or killed. And then uh, Stauffenberg himself was, sh was shot. He was shot for it, killed. And um, it, the whole plot failed, uh, basically. So not sure what would have happened if, you know, they would have, you know, killed Hitler you know, at that point, it may have it may have changed the war, possibly, at the end of it. But it did a lot of damage to the room uh, when it blew up. But I think Hitler. I think the only thing it did was they say it burned Hitler's pants or something like that, and uh, <laughs> kind of got lucky, I guess, with that. All right. Uh, then, of course, the next thing that happened, of course, at the end of War Two, uh, they had what they call the Battle of the Bulge, which happened, uh, which was real famous. And uh, this was actually uh, the Americans, like the United States, our, our um, worst battle we fought in World War II. This is our bloodiest battle. Uh, it was fought in the war uh, itself. It was fought between December 1944 to January of 1945. Uh, lasted about, I think I want to say, four or five weeks was how long the Battle of the Bulge was. And what happened was Hitler decided that he was getting, you know, attacked in the east by the Soviets. They were, the allies in the west are coming. He decides to do a, a winter offensive to try and see if he can defeat the allies in the west so he could face off the Soviets by himself without, you know, two-front war, I guess. So Hitler had decided, like in 1940, to attack through the Ardennes forest, uh, like he did before. Uh, and so what happened was, um, it was called different names. They call it sometimes the Battle of the Ardennes is one of the names they, they kind of nickname it. And um, the Germans uh, break through, uh, and it, it actually forms a huge bulge uh, in the Allied lines. This was like really one of our toughest battles because it was fought in the cold winter, with snow everywhere uh, and all of that. And um, so that's why the media started calling it that, the Battle of the Bulge. They kind of nicknamed it. And... Um, what happened was the Germans at one point encircled uh, the important town of Bastion, which I think is like eastern part of France at that point. And Bastion was an important uh, town because it was like a crossroads. Because what they think they, th they think Hitler was trying to do, he was trying to reach Antwerp, which was on the, um, I guess on the Baltic there, close to the English Channel. Uh, and then um, from there, he was going to cut the Allies in half like they did in 1940. Uh, however, the American forces that were there, if you know about this, were under a unit called the 101st Airborne Division, which was called the Screaming Eagles. They refused to surrender and give up the, that crossroads in the town and all that. And the general that was there at the time, Christy McAuliffe, uh, told the German generals that they were nuts, that they wouldn't, they wouldn't surrender. Nuts. That's what they told him, replied, nuts. Uh, and, of course, the Germans didn't understand what the hell he meant. <laughs> Nuts about that. Uh, but, um, but the, yeah, the Battle of the Bulge, it failed. It was really Hitler's last big gamble, I guess, in the war. Uh, because after that, the German armies collapsed uh, after that and began retreating back into Germany. Uh, and so within basically a few months after that, the Third Reich would pretty much collapse uh, pretty much on the heels of that overall. Uh, however, uh, the Americans and British in the West, uh, they decided to let the Soviets take Berlin, which is what happened. And so April to May of 1945, the last actual battle in Europe that was fought was the Battle of Berlin, uh, which I think ended like early May. And uh, Hitler apparently killed himself. He committed suicide in his bunker. At least that's the theory about what happened to Hitler, is that he killed himself. And so within a few days after uh, Hitler's dead, basically the Germans start surrendering to the Allies. I think they surrendered to the British and the Americans first and then the Soviets 
And then officially they say that the uh, last day that they really say uh, that um, basically when I guess the Germans, it's either May 8th or May 9th is usually the official date, but May 8th is usually the popular date they put at when the German armed forces really start officially surrendering, like signing documents, surrendering the war. That was later known as Victory in Europe Day. That's what they call it, VE Day, uh, which is still, by the way, celebrated pretty much in Europe. Soviet Union, it's actually on May 9th uh, because the Germans did not surrender to the, the Soviets until the next day, May 9th. Uh, talk about the end of the war and all that. Now, uh, yeah, <laughs> Germany was devastated after the war, totally just wiped out. A lot of their towns were destroyed because we bombed them from the air. And um, the amount of casualties in World War II was close to 60 million. That's a lot of people uh, that died uh, in World War II uh, and all of that. About 400,000 Americans would actually die in the war. I'll talk about the Holocaust and all that later. I've got that later, but uh, I'll talk about that uh, in the Nuremberg trials that kind of come after the war. I kind of put that at the end, by the way. So that's kind of what happens with, with that, with the war ending uh, in the in the Europe at that point, with the that part of the Axis powers out. So Italy and Germany are pretty much defeated uh, at that point. Now, let me move on. I need to talk about next and get into and discuss the Pacific War. That was the other aspect of the war that also happened, too, uh, as well. And, um, yeah, the Pacific, we still had to defeat the Japanese. That's the one thing you got to understand, which would go on longer to August, September 1945. Uh, and so, um, so we fought this extensive campaign. Uh, against the Japanese, mostly in the islands uh, of the Pacific. And um, the first uh, battle I need to talk about that was really important between the U.S. and Japan in the Pacific War was the Battle of Midway, uh, which took place in June of uh, 1942. Uh, I think I've got a few slides on that I can share with you, which are right here, June 4th to June 7th, of course, 1942. Uh, Midway was a very strategic battle uh, in the war, of course, led by Chester Nimitz, uh, who was the commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. You see there on the right. Uh, and um, uh, in this uh, battle, um, what happened was the Japanese under, um, yeah, it's very, of course, it's the, considered, by the way, the, the major turning point in the Pacific conflict. You know, you know, without our success, you know, with this battle, uh, the war may have dragged on a lot longer or maybe even stalemated uh, if it wasn't, you know, successful for that battle. But Yamamoto, Admiral Yamamoto, who I've talked about before, in the summer of 1942, uh, was deciding to invade Hawaii. That was his next thing he wanted to do. Uh, and uh, there was this island or set of islands, really, uh, in the Central Pacific they wanted to take called Midway. Uh, they wanted to use this as a base uh, to then attack, you know, the United States, you know, at Hawaii. And so the U.S. Navy had to respond to this. Uh, Chester Nimitz eventually sent uh, our aircraft carriers and our fleet uh, to attack them. And we were out outnumbered heavily four to one in the battle. So, of course, take place over like a three, four day battle uh, overall. Uh, in, in the Battle of Midway, the uh, U.S. Navy sank four Japanese aircraft carriers. Uh, those four you see there, were, of course, were all involved in Pearl Harbor. So we got revenge, you know, for Pearl Harbor at Midway. And um, the Japanese never really fully recovered uh, from this battle. They never, they, they never could replace the amount of uh, ships and men, like especially the pilots that they lost of course, at Midway. And so after that, you know, the Americans started, you know, winning winning the conflict uh, overall, which would take, you know, a few years, though, to do that. Uh, of course, one of our main policies that the United States military developed after Midway was we decided this whole new strategy to retake the Pacific would be called island hopping, or some people called it leapfrogging also as well. This was a coordination where basically the U.S. Navy 
uh, would kind of coordinate operations with the U.S. Marines and also the U.S. Army. And they were going to basically go and take back island by island and only really take the islands that were important because, you know, the Pacific has a lot of islands in it. Uh, and uh, we just mostly went after the ones we thought were strategic. It was the even case where we even bypassed some islands that we never took. And you had Japanese on there that that didn't know the war was over later. I don't know if you ever heard stories about that, but it's true about that. Yeah, people literally like several decades are like, the war's, we're, the, we're, they don't know the war's over. It's crazy. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, so um, the strategy went like this. The U.S. Navy... <clears throat> Uh, which was led by uh, Chester Nimitz, who I just told you about, the Pacific fleet anyway, they wanted to attack through the Central Pacific. And their main goal was to reach through the Mariana Islands and then get to, like, Japan that way. And Douglas MacArthur, who we've talked about before, I think, uh, he favored attacking through the Southern Pacific uh, to go toward, like, the Philippines and then come up from the south to take Japan. In that, that format, and that was just the different ways that they wanted to try to attack them and all that. Uh, the first big battle that really took place in the Pacific was the Battle of Guadalcanal. That was really our first series of islands we took back uh, from, from the Japanese. And uh, the Solomon Islands were really important because they were close to, like, New Guinea and, and Australia because the, the Japanese were trying to attack there and maybe seize part of that area. Uh, and um, and uh, and so it led to like one of the first major battles, like a land battle, where we fought the Japanese army uh, in the Pacific, uh, which was the Battle of uh, Guadalcanal, uh, which involved U.S. Marines. It lasted like some like six, seven months, uh, where we fought, uh, of course, against them and all that. And we eventually won it uh, and from there, and then we began pushing westward toward like the Philippines and all that. Um, they also had, like, we took the Gilbert Islands. That was the next series of islands I think we took next, which the Gilberts were um, part of a, a series of islands like Tarawa, you may have heard of, about Tarawa, which we took back that in late November 1943, which that was a famous U.S. Marine battle, too. That was also pretty bloody. But the most strategic uh, islands that we really took back uh, that are really uh, important uh, were um, the uh, Mariana Islands. Those are really considered to be the ones that were really important. See where it says Saipan there and Guam? Those were islands that we took back uh, that were very strategic in the war. Um, Guam, Tinian, Saipan, et cetera. And uh, the reason why they're important was because the U.S. then what they did was they created like bases there, air, air bases, where they could then start bombing Japan from the air, because uh, I think later you'll see that they start developing these new kind of bombers that can like fly like over 3,000 miles, like the B-29 uh, Super Fortress, it was called, uh, which they used to attack Japan and also drop the atomic bombs on Japan. And so that's why those those uh, islands were really important. In fact, Tinian is where they would launch the atomic bombs later uh, to attack you know Japan and all that. Uh, also, we took the Philippines as well, which took which that took it fell between 1944 to 45, and um, we actually neutralized the Japanese Navy in the Battle of Leyte Gulf, which happened in October of 1944, which was considered by the way the largest naval battle in world history, like the amount of battles, and I think the American side had like 20, 30 carriers, some crazy amount of carriers we had uh, in World War II. Actually, it was a battle that involved over 300 U.S. Navy ships. Yeah, seriously, that many ships we were involved in it. And Japan really never really did much naval-wise uh, after that between 1944 and 45. And so if you know what happened at the end of the war, the Japanese got desperate uh, to defeat the Americans. And so that's what led to the famous kamikaze suicide planes that they start using against the Americans where they basically use suicide planes to uh, attack uh, naval vessels uh, in the Pacific. It resulted in a lot of men getting killed, uh, close to 9,000 um, sailors uh, were killed and wounded 
uh, in a lot of these attacks. And it sank a bunch of them, too. Like you can see 34 ships or more uh, were sunk or damaged, of course, by, you know, uh, the kamikaze attacks and all that. Uh, there were some other battles, of course, that were very famous. Uh, here, of course, there's a famous picture of um, MacArthur wading ashore, of course, in the Philippines. Uh, well, of course, they took the Philippines later. It took them a while to take the Philippines. I think it was till 1945 where the Americans took it back. But um, Battle of Iwo Jima, which was often called Operation Detachment, that was, of course, considered to be uh, one of the most famous battles that was fought in the uh, Pacific War. Um, the, um, it was a famous Marine battle. In fact, it's considered to be the, the most famous U S Marine battle uh, in history. It's in the, you know, Marine Corps hymn, uh, if you know about that. And, uh, Iwo Jima was this volcanic Island that was East of J Japan, uh, part of the Bonin Islands, I believe it's called. And, uh, we wanted to take the Island because we wanted to use it as a close support bomber base, uh, which is true about that. Uh, because they, I think what it was is uh, any kind of plane or bomber that was damaged could land there, halfway there between that island and, and the Mariana Islands, where they're trying to fly back uh, from bombing Japan. Uh, and um, you know about Operation Detachment, um, they seized the island with considerable casualties. 26,000 men uh, were killed and wounded uh, in the battle. The Japanese, who they fought against, were tenacious. They didn't want to surrender. You know about this. They lost, and they fought to the last man. They, they, they really just, they didn't believe in surrendering the Japanese. And so they basically had to kill them all. That's what happened. Now, same thing on Okinawa happened, too. Where they just had to kill them all because they, they wanted to fight to the death, uh, which they did. Um, Iwo Jima, of course, is very famous uh, for an incident where... Uh, I think it's like six Americans raised the famous uh, American flag, you know, about this on Mount Suribachi. Um, and it was, of course, a famous picture that was taken by American photographer named Joe Rosenthal. He's the guy that actually took it. Uh, and yeah, six of the, is a very iconic picture. It's the, probably the most famous picture ever taken probably in World War II. Uh, it's now a famous, you know, statue and memorial in Washington, D.C. And um, six of the Marines, by the way, that raised it, three of them were later killed in the battle, um, which is true about that. Uh, there was actually one that was an Indian, Ira Hayes. He was one of the six men that actually raised the flag on, on Iwo Jima. Uh, then they had one more battle they had, too, which was the Battle of Okinawa uh, that was fought starting in, I think, April April to June of 1945. It was called Operation, I think it's called Iceberg, is what they called it, Operation Iceberg. And uh, Okinawa was important because it was one of the um, home islands of Japan. So we wanted to seize it. And what the plan was, after we took the island, we were going to do an invasion of Japan. We were actually going to invade it and try to conquer it and um, defeat the Japanese because they thought they were going to fight to the death, you know, and all that. And so that was actually going to be called Operation Downfall, uh, the actual invasion of the Japanese mainland. But we never did it, luckily, or we would have a lot of dead people. I forget how many they thought would die, but it was a lot. Soldiers would have died if we had to invade. And, um, yeah, Okinawa lasted for several months, like three months or so. Uh, I, started, I think in March really is when it started. But it was the bloodiest uh, a battle in the Pacific. It's, of course, the largest uh, amphibious invasion uh, in the Pacific also as well. We suffered a lot of casualties on the American side. 60,000, 70,000 Americans were killed and wounded uh, in the Battle of Okinawa. It was the second bloodiest battle, by the way, to um, the Battle of the Bulge. I think Battle of the Bulge, we had 19,000 men killed in the battle. I forget what this one was. It was a little less. The rest were all wounded. But uh, the Japanese, like I said, I told you, they wouldn't They wouldn't basically um, – actually, I think I'm wrong about that. 19, 20,000 was killed. I think uh, what was um, – Bulge was more than that. It was it was a little more than that, I think it was. But anyway, um, but um, yeah, the Japanese would fight to the death, uh, basically. And um, they were tenacious. 
And most of them pretty much were killed, basically. I think only a few you see there, maybe 11,000 possibly surrendered uh, overall. So, uh, yeah, the, what happened next, the United States, part of how we, uh, of course, got out of the war and ended it uh, eventually, 1945, was the development of the atomic bomb. It was something, of course, that helped to end the Pacific War uh, between the United States, of course, and the Japanese. And uh, the atomic bomb was something that um, we um, developed going back to like 1942-43. Now, in fact, it was Albert Einstein, I think, that had taught uh, American President Franklin D. Roosevelt into developing the atomic bomb, and it was known as the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project, of course, <clears throat> was a secret, very secretive uh, project run by the U.S. Army uh, to develop an atomic weapon. Uh, they called it like uh, different names, but I think some people call it a super weapon or something like that, or super bomb uh, was another thing they called it. Uh, as well. And um, the goal of the atomic bomb, by the way, to develop it was to use it on Germany, uh, try to end the war, maybe drop it on Berlin, and then the, the Nazis would surrender uh, to the Allied side. Uh, however, the war was over uh, in, in, Ger in Europe, and so they decided to use it on Japan. And so that's why Japan got, you know, bombed basically. And it was important. I mean, people, I know a lot of people don't like it because it killed a lot of people, but they think it, in the end, shortened the war uh, because they think if they would have had to invade Japan, you would have been looking at a lot of Americans dead. You know, I don't know how many it would have been, but maybe a million. I don't know if it's that many, but I think they have a theory that it would have been pretty big, uh, the amount of deaths. Um, now, there was an American general that ran the actual Manhattan Project. His name was Leslie Groves. He was actually a, um, a general that was in the U.S., Army of Corps of Engineers. He was actually an engineer. Uh, and um, he's actually the one that ran the project, which was done like all over the country, but the uh, main headquarters of the Manhattan Project was eventually developed in what is uh, Los Alamos, uh, New Mexico. They called it Manhattan Project because they did some experiments uh, at Columbia University in Manhattan in New York. So that's the name of why they called it. Uh, Groves, by the way, General Groves was famous, if you know about this, right before this, he had constructed the Pentagon building, which is, you know, the headquarters of the U.S. Department of Defense in Washington, D.C. He's one who designed and built it and all that. And after he did that, he ran the Manhattan Project. So that's really the two things that General Groves was kind of known for. And um, he hired this... Um, American physicist to actually run the project. He was J. Robert Oppenheimer. That's the guy who actually would develop the, the atomic bombs. Uh, and um, they called him Oppie. That's what all the scientists nicknamed him, Oppie for short. And um, Oppenheimer was the one that pretty much was seen as the father of the atomic bombs. He basically uh, designed them and developed them. Uh, and so this is something that he I later realized that was was just a wrong idea, uh, and he said that he was a destroyer of the world, or could be. Uh, I am the great destroyer, I think he said, uh, the fact that now I've created this super weapon that could really destroy the world and end the world uh, as we know it, which is still good, because they're still used uh, today. Uh, they would go on, by the way, to develop the first bomb, uh, which uh, go up here, uh, they would actually build, they actually think this thing called the... Uh, they called the Trinity test. I think it was the common nickname that they actually called the first testing of the bomb, which the first bomb built was actually called the gadget. That's what they nicknamed it, the gadget, because uh, they would kind of say, uh, hey, what are we building? We're building the gadget, they would say, because they didn't want anybody knowing what they were constructing. because It was all secretive, uh, the project. And so they built it onto a tower. Uh, at what is uh, Los Al uh, Alamogordo, New Mexico. That's where they tested it. And they blew it up. Uh, and they realized that they had this super weapon, you know, that they had. Uh, and it was a success. And so they began to build other bombs, uh, which would be used eventually on Japan. And so if you know about it, they would build like two bombs after that, one called Little Boy and the other one called Fat Man, which you can kind of see the difference. 
uh, between them. Uh, this is, of course, little boy. And that was Fat Man, the one in the background, the yellow bomb back there. And um, so these were like the first, you know, atomic bombs that were pretty much developed. Oops. Uh, and um, the bombs themselves, by the way, a little about them, uh, the little boy bomb was a uh, uranium bomb. That's what it was made out of. And then um, the other bomb was a plutonium bomb. Both were like what they call a fission type bomb, which uh, used with TNT uh, would cause a huge explosion, like a mushroom cloud, and create a huge explosion, which would you know destroy multiple miles, square miles of you know of a city. Uh, and um, what happened with the bombs? I'll come back to that in a second. That the bombs themselves were first shipped across the Pacific to Tianyin. Which I told you about earlier, which was in the Mariana Islands. And they put them on B-29 Super Fortress bombers, which were built by Boeing. Uh, and, um, and so they'd use these to atop, attack Japan with them because at that point they were already bombing Japan, like using like incendiary bombs, which were pretty devastating to like Tokyo. Like half of Tokyo was destroyed, uh, by, by the way, in the war by us bombing it. And... Um, yeah, Little Boy first, that bomb. Little Boy was first dropped on the city of Japanese city of Hiroshima, which was dropped on August 6th, 1945. It was dropped by this plane that's very famous called the Enola Gay, uh, which was captained by this man named Paul Tibbets. I've got a picture showing uh, Paul Tibbets with his crew of the Enola Gay, which is kind of in the background there. Oh, uh, that's them right there. Uh, and um, the plane was actually named after his mother. That's where the name came from. Enola Gay, if you wonder about the name. All oh, the shorts, don't you? <laughs> the shorts are great. <laughs> That's the way shorts used to be the old days. And um, I remember them short shorts back in the 1980s. <laughs> but anyway, um, but um, so, yeah, that, that was the crew. And they didn't know actually what they were going to do until they were in the air. Uh, and Tibbetts told them that they were going to bomb Japan. Uh, with this, you know, uh, nuclear bomb. And um, anyway, um, what happened was the first bomb that they dropped, which I told you August 6, 1945, it would actually kill about 100,000 people. And it was dropped. Uh, several square miles literally were just obliterated. Uh, it was like, like a hurricane went through and just wiped it out. And uh, those, uh, those that did die, died from like the radiation poison that came afterwards, uh, which of course occurred. And as you know, these atomic bombs are very famous for um, the mushroom cloud that they're well known for, which you see right here. That was actually a picture that was taken from the Enola Gay uh, right there uh, after it blew up. Uh, of course, hydrogen bombs are even larger mushroom cloud. It's like a big bubble, I think, when it, when it blows up. Here's the pictures, of course, of the actual devastation. Uh, that's in black and white. And then here's one in color, just to give you an idea of how devastating the bomb was when it was dropped on Hiroshima. So literally a several square miles were just totally just obliterated uh, by the bomb. Uh, there was a second bomb, another atomic bomb. I told you Fat Man was dropped three days later by the B-29 box car on Nagasaki. Yeah, that one. That one killed about 80,000 people or so uh, as well. So both those bombs uh, were devastating. Uh, we actually didn't have any more bombs. Like the United States didn't have any more atomic bombs to really drop on Japan. They didn't know that, though, about that. But uh, the Japanese, though, um, within a few days later, surrendered. Uh, they think that was part of the reason why Japan surrendered was because they feared we had more of these weapons uh, but the other reason they also surrendered too that most people don't know was that Japan uh, got the uh, Russia de uh, the Soviet Union declared war on Japan. Uh, so they were kind of fearful that the Soviets would come in and seize part of northern Japan from like take their territory. Uh, and so they basically that's the other reason they surrendered too. And so August 15th, 1945, the Japanese began surrendering to the allies in like China, Asia, the Pacific, uh, et cetera. 
And uh, that date, August 15th, became known as um, VJ Day or Victory Over Japan Day, as they call it. Uh, later, like a couple weeks later, uh, Japan then officially surrendered, like with, you know, documentation and all of that. And that occurred on um, September 2nd, 1945. The Japanese actually surrendered in Tokyo Bay uh, to the U.S. forces on the battleship USS Missouri. And that was the official date of when World War II actually came to an end. So World War II itself was almost to a day, you know, six years. Because you remember correctly, uh, Hitler had invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939. That's almost exactly six years uh, when it, I guess, ended. You know, more or less worldwide. Uh, like I said, uh, the war, of course, led to a lot of people being killed. 50, 60 million people uh, were killed, likely, uh, in World War II. That's a lot of people. Uh, and um, one of the most famous things that happened, you know, after, you know, the war ended, like especially in Europe, uh, was they found out that the Germans had committed a lot of atrocities. Uh, in the war, uh, which, you know, the most famous was the Holocaust, which you've heard of, which the Jews today call the Shoah. Uh, and apparently the Germans had gone through to basically systematically commit mass genocide, uh, not just against Jews, but other groups as well uh, that they killed. Uh, but Jews were obviously, you know, targeted the most uh, in World War II uh, and uh, include all kinds of different ways they were murdered. Uh, some were murdered through different um, pogroms of uh, actions against them, uh, mass shootings uh, that took place, like especially on the Eastern Front. Uh, there were cases where they had these uh, execution squads that went out and killed Jews, just murdered them in cold, cold blood and buried them in mass graves. Uh, then, of course, they got more uh, into a better policy of it by 1942-43. And that led to the development of concentration camps, especially the, the, the so-called death camps or extermination camps uh, that were eventually developed uh, in the war. Uh, the most famous is Auschwitz, as you know. Auschwitz-Birkenau had the most people that died uh, during, during the war uh, in the Holocaust. And um, Auschwitz-Birkenau was a um, concentration slash death camp. It was both, uh, basically. They had these work camps where they'd work people to death uh, as like slave labor. But those right there, Auschwitz, Belzec, Chilno, Matadek, Sobibor, Treblinka, those were considered the most famous of the death camps that the Germans developed in World War II, where they used like gas chambers and things like that to gas people and then burn their bodies, like cremate them and all that. Uh, an estimated 6 million Jews, by the way, died uh, in the Holocaust, at least it's estimated, uh, more or less. And they, they weren't just Jews. They had all kinds of people that were killed, too. Ethnic Poles, Soviet civilians. There were cases where a lot of, I think some like 3 million Soviet POWs died in German hands. The Roma, as in the gypsy people, which you've heard of, they were targeted. Handicapped people, political and religious dissidents, like even Catholic priests were killed, if you know about this, uh, during the war. Oh, and also homosexual people and gays were also targeted uh, as well. So 11, 12 million people may have died under the Nazis and Hitler, you know, because of all that. Uh, here's a map showing you like uh, the um, the Nazis used like railroads to ship all these people to Poland, where most of the death camps were uh, and all that. And uh, there was a guy named Adolf Eichmann, you may have heard of, who got arrested later uh, close to like, early 60s, and he was accused of coordinating all the shipping of Jews to, uh, of course, the to be executed later or killed later and all that. Uh, they also had this other thing I'll mention, too, uh, at the end of World War II that was famous. They had the Nuremberg trials. You may have heard of these. The Nuremberg trials were a series of war, uh, war crimes trials where they basically arrested a bunch of high-ranking Nazis in the military and in the government uh, who were accused of being involved in various war crimes or crimes against humanity or, or in, even in the Holocaust where they did stuff. And um, the most famous that was actually arrested and prosecuted after the war was Hermann Gehry. He was found guilty, by the way, at the Nuremberg trials in 1946. 
And they ended up executing something like around 10 Germans were actually put to death uh, for being involved. Uh, like high ranking people were actually executed. Other people probably were too, but I'm talking about high ranking people. And, um, and a bunch of people were even imprisoned uh, as well. So now I'm going to get to it later, but after the after World War II ends, we're going to have, of course, the Cold War break out. That's the next thing that's going to happen, which I'll try to have some kind of lecture about that next week, about what the Cold War was, because that's our well, last topic I've got really uh, for this class that I need to cover, which will be on the final later. Uh, but I'll talk about that later and kind of go into, at least talk about the major causes of what the Cold War was about uh, and all that. Now, I've got a few minutes. I can go ahead and review real quick uh, over the topics, of course, we've covered pretty much before uh, overall. And um, let's see. So uh, I don't know if I have to cover everything because we covered some stuff already today, but I'll cover like some of the old stuff we covered before. I'll go ahead and review. But uh, what were the main causes of why the United States of America entered World War II? That was because of the attack on Pearl Harbor by Japan, uh, which, of course, occurred on December 7th, 1941. And of course, the United States declared war on Japan the next day, December 8th. Um, what are some early calls of why the U.S. supported China over Japan? Uh, because China was taking over, uh, China was taking over, not China, Japan was taking over China. Uh, and of course, one of the major causes of it was the um, uh, Second Sino Japanese War, which happened in 1937 that went to 1945 last about seven, eight years, that was considered a bloody conflict, which got us to support the Chinese side uh, in the war. Uh, what Chinese general does the U.S. support in its bid to defeat the uh, invading Japanese? That's Chiang Kai-shek. He was kind of like the dictator and general that ran the Republic of China at the time. They called him actually the Generalissimo. That was his actual title. Uh, but he was more like a military-style dictator, uh, Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, what volunteer Air Force made of America policy was created by Claire Chenault to aid the Chinese air power against Japan? That was the AVG, uh, American Volunteer Group, which was later called the Flying Tigers. They went over there right before the war broke out, uh, which kind of helped antagonize the Japanese because we were trying to aid them, aid China against Japan and all that. Uh, what famous event occurred on December 7, 1941? Uh, the Japanese um, Navy with their um, with uh, air power attacked uh, Pearl Harbor uh, in uh, what is Hawaii, Oahu, Hawaii. And that precipitated, of course, the um, United States, of course, entering World War II at that point. Uh, what famous Japanese admiral planned the initial attack on the United States? That was, of course, Admiral Yamamoto. He's one to plan that, and he also planned Midway. Uh, what primary target did the Japanese go after in Pearl Harbor? They attacked what is uh, Battleship Row, uh, where we had our main capital ships like the USS Arizona. What famous U.S. battleship was obliterated the attack, causing half the casualties on Oahu? That was, of course, the um, USS Arizona. It was totally destroyed, uh, and about 1,200 men were killed on it. Uh, the other ship that had like, um, I think I want to say 500 men that got killed was the Oklahoma. It was the other one that capsized. Uh, what were some turning points, battles in uh, World War II in 1942 that led to the Allies' victories causing the decline of the Axis powers in the war? Uh, they had the uh, second battle at El Alamein, which happened in North Africa. That was one of them. Yeah, that was important. Where the British defeated uh, uh, defeated uh, Rommel, Erwin Rommel. Uh, the other, second one was the um, Battle of Stalingrad, where the Germans were defeated by the Soviets on the Eastern Front. And don't forget about the Battle of Midway, which happened in June of 1942, where the United States Navy defeated the Japanese Navy to the Pacific. Uh, what German general did the uh, British General Bernard Montgomery defeat, defeat at the Second Battle of El Main? That was Erwin Rommel. Uh, what was his nickname? Not uh, uh, Rama was known as the Desert Fox because uh, he was um, uh, real good at uh, tank warfare uh, in the desert, a mechanized warfare in the desert. Yeah, in the desert. Uh, what army did he head up in his attempt to conquer North Africa, which happened between like 1940 to about 43? 
That was the Africa Corps, which was actually an um, Italian-German mechanized force. What was Operation Torch, who led the U.S. force in North Africa? Operation Torch was the Americans' invasion of North Africa into what is Morocco uh, and what is Algeria. It was led by, of course, Dwight D. Eisenhower, who later led D-Day. Why was the Battle of Stalingrad a turning point for the why the Soviets began to defeat the Germans on the Eastern Front? Uh, what happened was on the, on the Eastern Front, the, uh, the Germans got encircled uh, at Stalingrad, and uh, their, a whole army got defeated got defeated and captured, which was the German Sixth Army. And it was the battle that was really the turning point of the whole war, which led to why the Germans lost World War II. Um, so they, after that, the Germans couldn't win any battles pretty much after that. And uh, they, lost the war, they lost the war later. <laughs> Operation Husky was that. Uh, that was, of course, the Allied invasion of Sicily, uh, which led to the Italian campaign, which happened in July of 1943. Was led by the Americans and British. What occurred to Mussolini after the Allies invaded Italy? Uh, Mussolini resigned as prime minister. Uh, he was uh, resigned in disgrace because Sicily fell. And so uh, what did Italy do afterwards? Italy then um, switched to the Allied side. They, they dropped out of the Axis powers. Uh, and, of course, this angered um, uh, Hitler. And uh, so um, it's like it went out for some reason, didn't it? I don't know why it, it does that once in a while. I don't know why, I don't know why it did that. The screen went out for some reason. But um, go back up here real quick. Yeah, I was on this one right here. But, um, but yeah, that one uh, the, was on this slide right here. But, yeah, Mussolini uh, – would drop out because of what happened with Sicily. And so Italy, Italy uh, would switch to the allied side. And then of course, Hitler, you know, would continue the war. And that's what led to the so-called Italian campaign, which led to the fall of Rome on June 4th, 1944. Uh, then the rest of the stuff we've already covered to, from today. I think we did all this already. We, in today's lecture, we did pretty much from D-Day, up to the end of World War II in Europe. Uh, then I think we did the Pacific Campaign or Pacific War uh, today. It looks like I did all those pretty much from looking at the questions that I've got looking at. So those are those are all pretty much done overall. So uh, anyway, um, I guess that's it for World War II pretty much. Um, if you have any questions, of course, about this lecture uh, from today, uh, let me know. Uh, about, you know, any kind of comments, questions you have, of course, about the lecture uh, overall. So I will be posting it afterwards, of course, to my YouTube channel, uh, like I always do. Uh, like I said, next week, I'm going to um, try to get some kind of lecture together uh, on the Cold War. It might be recorded. I don't know. I'm not sure how I'm going to do this exactly because I got to look in and see exactly what I got to cover because I'm trying to work on the final exam right now, which is almost done. Uh, and uh, it does have a lot of Cold War stuff on it. So I may have to create a lecture for sp specifically for that time period to fill in for that. So it might be recorded, also the lecture, which I'll post to my YouTube channel if I do uh, more than anything. So that's it for today. Uh, just remind you, don't forget about the um, that last assignment you got left, which is the vocab, the final vocab. Uh, remember, if you're exempt from the final uh, you do need to turn in that that last assignment uh, if you want to, of course, be exempt and all that uh, overall. Because if you're not, then you'll have to take the final. And if you want to take the final anyway, it probably won't affect your grade. So and all that. So that's it for today. Uh, Y'all take care. I hope you all have a good weekend coming up. But I'll try to have that last lecture for you later um, on the Cold War. So y'all take care.